So guys, let me hand over to the panel, a progression from uh, the discussion yesterday, um, being led by Colin Bell. And I think we, we're all incredibly fortunate to actually have Colin in our midst. I mean, as we know, he's been a pioneer in this industry. He's been a trailblazer. He's been a maverick. Um, but, you know, he's, he's sort of done his stuff and, 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 and the commercial thing. But he's come and he, he gives back uh, selflessly. He, he's passionate about this um, industry. It's amazing that we've got him onto the South African Tourism Board. So he's in the, in the sort of energy there. He gets on well with the minister. Um, it was just incredibly edifying for me to... We, we went to, um, earlier this year and watched uh, Minister Hanukum's budget vote. And after that, he takes everybody out to dinner. And it's the whole top team of SAT and the National Department and the Portfolio Committee. And Colin gave the keynote address. Um, looking at big, hairy, audacious goals and looking at doubling our numbers and actually trying to focus people on the way forward. So, Colin, it's really great to have you with us um, in, 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 in hopefully our, our sort of reinvigorated Satsa family. And thanks for being, being who you are and thanks for your, your, your just incredible, generous time and uh, um, energy. So, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, David. Wow. We never thought on a Saturday morning we would have this Fantastic, David. You've done an incredible job at Satsa, and I think you should have an absolute round of applause from all of us. I think this... And I've watched David go through the whole visa story. Literally, he lost four to five kilograms. I don't think we realize the stress he was under. And the way he galvanized the tourism industry, I think, has just been extraordinary. And... Uh, the mere fact that Sora Ramaphosa is now chairing the ministerial meeting, I think, is a fantastic indictment of the good work, David. So thank you very much for batting for all of us. So, folks, we've got to, we want to, with your permission, just change the topic a fraction, the role of the tour operator. We want to change that to the role and the future of the tour operator because there's a whole lot of threats. And, but before we get there, I'd like to tell a story. Am I allowed to tell a story? On one of my very first safaris, when we first set out years and years ago in the 70s and 80s, I can't remember which, I had a Hugh Hefner's lawyer on safari, and we took him around Botswana, and we hoped like hell he'd be coming up with a whole of the bunnies, but he arrived with his family, <laughs> so the whole of Maun was waiting for, <laughs> with great anticipation at the airport to see who was coming off the airplane. Anyway, old uh, Michael Balaban stepped off, and uh, he told me about a fax machine. It was the most extraordinary thing. Here we're in the middle of the bush, and he's telling me about how you put a letter in one side and a letter came out the other side. I said, no, you absolute, your coffee's cold. Anyway, I got back to Mount, and we started to find out that the fax machine was reality, and we were one of the early implementers, and it really transformed our business. And then, I think it was about 10, 12 years later, Michael Balaban came on a second safari with me, and he told me about this great information highway. And I thought, my goodness, this sounds like a whole lot of hogwash. But his fact story was true. But I thought, no, 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 I can't understand how somebody's going to spend hours writing up pieces of paper and putting it onto this great information without getting paid. So we became completely great information highway adverse to the extent that somebody in the Florida went and stole our dona domain name. I mean, if you go and Google my old name, you'll find it's some guy who sits out of, out of Florida. We were so slow into the game that we had to catch up. And the interesting thing for me was how, if you're not on your game, how you can be left behind. And I think the tourism industry is going through extraordinary changes. And the biggest change which is coming up, in my view, is Airbnb. Suddenly, a bed is going to be put in direct access to the consumer. And if that's not a threat to the tourism industry, and in particular to the, to the tour operator, I think it's something we've really got to be thinking about our businesses. How can we ensure that we stay in place? And the best example of that is the retailers. When the retail industry was predicted to be doom and gloom, particularly in America, something like tens of thousands of retailers went out of business. So that was the guys who were sleeping, the guys who were like me with the great inter internet highway and all the rest of it, the guys who snoozed their businesses were destroyed. But you had people like Matthew Upchurch from Virtuoso. You had the flight center folks. They took advantage of the internet, and they made their businesses thrive. So what we are, I believe, is we're at the cusp right now. Do our businesses, especially the tour operators, thrive or they 
go downwards. And we're at that crossroads. And it depends on how we behave and how we go and add value to the chain, whether we're going to be there or not. And I think every individual company has to start thinking about the threat of Airbnb. So with that, so if you, with your permission, we're going to change it just not only to the role, but the role and the future. And I've got a fantastic, diverse panel with me. And I think I'd like everybody to introduce themselves, starting on my left. And we'll just go through the introductions, and then we'll get into the topic. Hi, I'm Gary Lotter. I'm the Managing Director of GoToAfrica. Uh, my name's Lance Smith. I'm the Executive for Sales for Avis, and been supplying the tour operator market for 20 years so far. Hi, Colin Thaver. Uh, I own a company called Southern Africa 360 Luxury Holidays. Uh, my name's uh, my name's Martin Boerter. I look after the inbound brands for Turvis Destination Management. So you see, we've got three completely different types of tour operators, and we've got a provider. And I think it's that combination which is quite interesting for today. So, if I could go through, f starting with Colin. Colin's got quite an interesting definitions of all the different types of tour operators. So maybe, Colin, can we kick off with you, please, and you run through what are the different types of tour operators for those, just so that we've got clarity of where we're going. I think initially we've got the OTA and the OTO. And OTA is an online travel agent, and an OTO is an online travel operator. There's a subtle difference between them, but a huge difference in terms of end result of offering. And OTA is basically somebody that offers a point-to-point -point service. For example, where you can go online and you can book an accommodation, like bookings.com or Expedia, or you could have uh, things like flight sites that have now come up where you can go in and book your accommodation. And OTA is slightly different, where they've adapted three or four different platforms onto, this, onto their website, where you can, like Virtuosa is, is a prime example, but you've got something that Google's put out called Vita. Now, Vita will basically give you an opportunity to book your accommodation, and it will give you a button that can basically say you can book your activities. However, they cannot fulfill a point-to-point -point meet and greet and the relevant services within a country. Uh, a tour operator, I think by definition, is misunderstood by a lot of people. A tour operator basically is someone who operates by putting together a variety of services, and we call it packaging, from various components of tours, hotel bookings, transportation, meals, language guides, optional tours, and sometimes even maybe land, land arrangement flights between the destination. Uh, a travel agent, by definition, and Otto will basically be able to share a lot more here, is somebody who will buy a package from a tour operator, but has a better understanding of many destinations where a tour operator just focuses on their main destination and, and are experts in it, where you'll find a travel agent will have a wide variety of understanding of destinations, but will still go back to a specific tour operator to get that relevant service. Okay, we're clear. All these different characters, all different players, and actually most of them are sitting over here. So, Martin, can we start with you? Where do you see your role? Just talk us through your particular business, all the different commission structures which you need, and where you see your future. Um, we, we're a traditional, we just service the, the traditional channel, uh, which is, uh, I guess I'm preaching to people who know all of this already, but the traditional channel is us servicing an outbound wholesaler who in turn has a very broad retail network. And, um, yeah, so that's the, that's the channel, what we do. We make sense of product. We involve ourselves in production of our brochures, their brochures. Uh, we plug the streets. We create markets. We support markets. Um, so it's a fairly broad service, whatever it is that we do. It's hard to box it into particular things. And it also varies. We have a fairly broad global presence uh, of, of clients. So, you know, different markets call for different things. And... Uh, we, yeah, so what we do is fairly different in particular, depending on the market. But it's, yeah, a, but it's a, the point, I don't know if you want me to touch on that, Colin, is that the channel is quite long to be serviced. Yeah, it's a huge channel. I think that's where the 30, 35% comes from because the retailer wants their chunk, the overseas wholesaler produces the brochure wants their chunk, 
and you want the chunk. So they've got to have their 30, 35%. And I think that causes quite a lot of confusion and sort of angst in amongst the product suppliers. Why am I giving away such a big chunk of it? But that's really that model of the three different tiers, each trying to make 10% or 11%, uh, and out of the 10, 11%, they've got to try and make their margin of 1% or 2%. So I think that's really, really with the 30-35s come in. Colin, do you want to go, you're slightly different to the two of model. Do you want to talk us through yours yeah. and the commission <coughs> levels? Basically what I've done with my approach is created a niche within the market and started focusing on offering a product that's slightly different. Uh, concentrating on the, on the luxury side, but affording a client an opportunity to downscale his booking to his specific needs. So if I had to put a package together offering, just say, a tour in Cape Town, which would be a standard city tour, I will initially give the client that with a price, but then further down in his quote is I'll basically subtly break it down for an upsell, where I'd sell perhaps a tour to Cape Town City, but including Table Mountain, a second one including Table Mountain and Robin Island. And a third one basically saying, I'll give you a private with a cultural experience within it. So it's exactly the same product, but not just selling it to get the minimum out of it, but to get the maximum out of it by upselling. And in that way, it's differentiated me by keeping my product simple in the terms that it's the same product, but just laid in different, in different structures, as opposed to trying to put in front of a client 10 different options for him to do on his free or spare day in the, in when, when he's on holiday. Okay, Gary? So, let me start off by saying we're not an OTA. Um, and I think a lot of people misunderstand the kind of business model that we operate. But, but just let me put it in context. I think the role of a tour operator is a couple of things. I think it's, uh, it's a marketing role. And I think it's a distribution and consolidation role. And I think we all do that in various shapes and forms. So, at Go to Africa, what we do is, uh, and why I say we're not an OTA, is we we don't transact online, we don't take credit card payments online, we don't sell beds online. But what we do do is we fulfill the marketing piece um, in a digital format. So we've got a, a hugely extensive digital marketing platform that we use to market destinations, products and experiences across Africa. We drive the inquiries from that digital marketing platform to a sales force which is not unlike a traditional retail agency and in fact most of our um, uh, most of our sales consultants are independent. They are uh, independent retail consultants that work for us on a fully commissioned basis. And then we're a bit of a hybrid as well because we fulfill the traditional inbound tour operator role of consolidation um, and in destination support. So um, it's, uh, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting business in that it includes all of those elements that are required from a traditional tour operator. But at the same time, we don't follow the traditional channel model. We don't go and market to wholesalers and retailers um, around the world. We use, a, we use a digital channel to do that. Um, uh, and that, that we can talk about it. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly extensive process in itself. Um, but that's how we do what we do. So when Mr. Balaban came on safari to Botswana, he told me about this great internet highway. He had never, ever dreamt that your kind of business would be in existence. And yet they are now taking a big chunk of the industry. So Lance, over to you. <coughs> As a supplier, what do you want from a tour operator? So maybe I can do what Otto did yesterday and tell a story. Um, once upon a time, I joined the car rental industry, and it was 1998. And I came from a, a finance background, not sales. And we looked at the car rental business, and if you arrive at an airport today, there's the red one, there's the green one, there's a yellow one. We're all lined up, and if you go and look at our ladies, they're probably pretty much the same. They've all got uniforms. We've all got a computer system. We've all got a rental agent uh, smiling and meeting you in the, in the car park. And if you check our rates and conditions, most likely they're pretty much the same. So what we were and what we still are is a commodity. Um, in 1998, 99, 80% of our business went through two operators, yourselves. Um, all of that business was on account. Um, the tour operators actually set our prices for us. We didn't have a retail program as well. We didn't have an internet. Um, we worked directly uh, with you guys. And we arrived at Indaba with massive, massive suitcases full of data uh, to hand over to tour operators to fly back home with. <laughs> but what happened? The internet happened to us. 
Um, brokers arrived, a company called Holiday Autos arrived on the scene. Um, and then all of a sudden, British Airways woke up and realized they had a holiday program which could go online. And then the explosion of car rental brokers and OTAs. In 2007, in fact, slightly before that, I went to the States and I'd done an environmental scan and heard about what we discussed yesterday, revenue management. We were 30 years behind the airline industry as a car rental business. My colleagues in America were just starting. So I came back and said, well, let's start a small program. And I set a small team up to start understanding what revenue management was. In 2008, 2009, um, we as Avis walked away from all OTAs and car rental brokers. And the reason we did that was we were in an absolute conflict with them all the time around how they set their prices. In that we were giving them net rates and they were not only undercutting us as a business, but they were undercutting you, our tour operators. So we took quite a bold stance. It really hurt us because it just walked away and went to our competitors. What, where are we today? Uh, today, 75% of our business is online. Um, the market sets the price, the tour operator doesn't. We integrate with every single supplier in the main, where we can. So all our major uh, people from airlines, OTAs, brokers, and the large tour operators overseas, we've integrated directly into their systems. We no longer take bags of information with us to Indaba. We take sometimes a memory stick. Most of the time they download it off our sites. Of the money that we get paid today, 70% is prepaid, not 60 days in arrears. We run a dynamic pricing system. It's run per country globally. So some of the debates, they were talking about China and India yesterday in the thing and having separate things in the car rental business. Every single week, every single day, we set prices by country. We use a floating exchange rate. We don't buy forward. So the rate of the day is applicable. Very difficult to, to work with a tour operator that isn't on a floating exchange rate. In America, we employ robots to do our pricing. We have three robots and seven strategies. They send out creepy crawlies every day to the competitor sites, pull back rates, and those creepy crawlies and those robots change the prices five million times a day in the North American market. To all of our people that we work with now, we work with on commissions, retail rates, we set the rate as the market allows us and as we decide. And in a lot of cases, what we find, we've actually, in, in most things, taken a lot of conflict out because the guys have come to us now that they've, we've gone back to the OTAs purely on a retail price, we set their pricing. Um, there is no conflict anymore because they said you either want the business or you don't. So if you put the right price there, you appear and you get bought. If you don't put the price there, you fall away. My colleagues here asked me, so what do we want from tour operators as a car rental industry? Uh, I found it really interesting yesterday, the um, presentation on the Middle East. I think for me that's a classic example of why tour operators are absolutely critically important to the car rental industry. We're a single product. For us to go to those regions as a single product it's not cost effective. So we would love to go to particularly these emerging markets and developing markets with those people. But already in some of the markets we're there with Emirates, with Etihad, with them, because most of them already have got car rental for sale on their sites. And most of them have got a broker supplying that car rental to them already. We're just one supplier in a broker program. The one thing that wasn't fulfilled yesterday, and Otto, you started there, and I thought it was an interesting thing but wasn't spoken about, and that was the non-disclosure of rates, so a package rate. And we didn't really talk about that. And I think there's still a critical role for packaging from our tour operators, where we do give packaged net rates. These rates should never be disclosed to the market, and we can certainly work very closely with the tour operators. So today, the tour operators to the car rental industry probably are the smaller part of, of the program, an important part of the program, particularly in niche markets. Um, and that's my spiel. Sure. Five million calculations a day. So Martin, how does that make you feel when you want to try and cost a brochure 18 months out? 
Well, um, no, it's obviously uh, it's a it's a very difficult thing to to in order to do, but the reality is that until the world changes completely, there we we stuck with static brochures and uh, what all our efforts really are where dynamic rates are are, are, are but they are becoming the reality. And as Danny and Martin spoke yesterday, uh, we haven't solved the problem yet. We we do have a situation where we've got static brochures. They they're still around and. Uh, Ah, certainly from our organization's point of view, we work very hard on technology to incorporate dynamic rates and to be able to feed dynamic rates through to our partners. Um, so we try to bridge the gap. Uh, and there's a, for now, there's a kind of parallel stream of people using dynamic rates and static rates. But it's, I've got to say it's complicated and it's not easy. Did you really answer the question? <laughs> the tricky bit is how do we actually embrace the new world with the old world. And there's some people who desperately want to have a brochure. I mean, maybe the issue is, maybe the 18 months has to start sort of crimping down to 12 months, and maybe it's got to crimp even to six months. But there's some issue which is going to have to give because we've got the old world and the new world. Gary, how do you handle that? I think, I think the, the place to start in terms of the future of tour operators is, is for me, is that there's absolutely a, a role for tour operators. Um, but that that tour operators need to embrace technology. I think I think it's here to stay, um, but I also think it's an incredible opportunity. So we're in an interesting position as tour operators in South Africa. I think we're close to the product. Um, and I think we've got access to technology. So so for those of you that 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 aren't embracing technology, um, there's a there's an incredible opportunity at our fingertips. And then in terms of the role uh, of a tour operator. Um, we, um, I, I, I think there's, despite the, the fact that there's a, a, a technological way of approaching us, there's still a demand for product consolidation, for consultation. And um, I, I told the story uh, to the guys a little bit earlier when we, we were discussing uh, this meeting, was that my, my in-laws went to Kenya last week. They booked a lodge at the Masai Mara um, directly. Um, my mother-in-law, I love my mother-in-law, she decided to... Um, she decided to book the air herself, um, um, and she decided to, to book the hotels on self, herself. Um, she used, I think, Booking.com. She booked the wrong hotel on the wrong night. I had to come and help her correct that. Um, and once she'd corrected that, we still, I think she's going to get a refund. I'm not sure. Um, then she did the air herself. And um, when I spoke to them a couple of days ago, they just got back. They'd had a great time, but they were a little bit tired. I said, why are you tired? There was a problem with the air, and they got back, and they landed in Joburg at 12 o'clock at night. So they spent the night sitting in the transit area at Johannesburg International before they th flew through to Cape Town. So I said, you need a good tour operator. <laughs> <laughs> so they did it themselves. But, they, they, you know, I don't know if they'll do it, do it again um, themselves. But there's definitely a role for tour operators, and, and tour operators have to add value. And I think in terms of the, the technology piece, um, integration... Um, rates, bar rates, all of that's here to stay. And, and if we want to stay relevant, we have to. We have to be building businesses that are able to utilize technology, not be scared of it, that are able to utilize bar rates, flexible rates, integration. That stuff's coming. We can't avoid it. But, but it's an opportunity. It's not a threat. And, um, and uh, at Go to Africa, as an example, um, I'll tell you, we've spent, doing, we spent about 15 million rand over the last three years building a digital platform that we think will integrate um, uh, right the way across the board. Um, and at the same time, still maintain our traditional model of, of um, a group of qualified salespeople selling and promoting Africa, both digitally and physically, to potential travelers to Africa. But the technology piece is critical, and we're not running away from it, we're running towards it. Thank you, Gary. Colin, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think just adding to what it is. <coughs> In my specific cases, I've defined a target market. Uh, I clearly defined the niche within that and offered a premium service and value for money. And just being efficient and different because I think there is a technology boom at the moment and I'm just riding the wave of innovation and finding better ways of incorporating it into my business. And I do use an 
OTA hotel supplier. Um, as part of my game plan, especially when it comes to high season, you can never find availability. But it's amazing how an OTA has got availability. So I may lose my margin, but I've got availability, which makes me unique because a fellow tour operator who's going the traditional way can't get that availability, and I can. So in that way, it makes me niche, and it makes me a lot more focused. So to a, so to a large degree, I think I use Gary's type of synergy, but still operating as a traditional tour operator. Thanks, Colin. <clears throat> what I'd like to do for the next section is that I'd like to throw it open to the floor. I think what we have to do as a tour industry is we have to try and almost feed off each other. How can we, what tips can we learn from each other to put into our businesses to ensure that we thrive and we survive the next sort of five, six years of a complete onslaught onto our industry? The Airbnb is coming. It's going to really change the way business is done. And I'd really like to go back to the Matthew Upchurch example. Matthew is the head of Virtuoso, and he took all these retail travel agencies, not only in the States, but around the world, and he's made them so efficient and so entrenched in the travel, retail travel industry sector. That little, those retailers today make far more money than they could have ever done on the old system. They've just survived and they thrived by adding value. And this is one of the biggest things. They, they make sure that they have amenities at every single facility. So when their guest goes, arrives at a particular hotel, there's added value. They add experience to the whole extraordinary uh, journey, especially to Africa. I mean, one of the things about Mrs. Schwartz sitting in New York City or Paris, London, whatever, when Mrs. Schwartz books a safari through a virtuoso travel agent, they get the most wonderful, wonderful experience they can't get by going direct. And I think that's what we really have to do, is we have to start thinking about changing our industry right now as a tour operator, because there are threats. So maybe if we can chuck it open to the floor and say, guys, how do, how do, what other things do we have? What, are, what other ideas do we have to change the way we do business to make sure that we're going to be there in the next 20, 30 years? You happy with that? Any suggestions? Anybody put their hands up. Thanks, Otto. Morning, everybody. Um, on the retail side, and Colin, you, you certainly sort of touched on that, and, and the States is, is certainly a front runner. It's a process we're going through in South Africa at the moment extensively as well, is a, is a, a review of the entire structure of how the travel agent is adding value to the customer. So when we went to Zericoms 10 to 15 years ago, the, 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 the shift was from primary revenue stream being commission-based to becoming a service fee based industry. Now, just think about that for a moment because what we're talking about is a situation where you were an agent of the supplier versus an agent of the customer. And with the customer becoming central in everything that we do today, how you offer it, what you offer, the customer is driving all the decision making. We aren't. They're informed, they have access to information, and we have to re engineer the value proposition. Part of that is how you also re-engineer your revenue streams. There's always room for commission. There's always room because you should be given financial support for providing business to a supplier. But it shouldn't be the only driver of revenue. And so the key when you re-engineer or look at your business models is to say, well, how am I adding value? And how will the customer feel comfortable to pay for that value? Wow. Thank you, Otto. Question over there. Can we get a microphone? There we go. Oh, cue jumping. Can you introduce yourself, please? Orna, Orna from Wild Wing Safaris. Um, I would disagree with the um, suggestion that we would make it on a fee-based, service fee-based uh, model. Um, my experience is that guests Nowadays, they can compare, they do compare, they price everything out. <coughs> Excuse me. They price everything out. They look online, they ask for breakdowns. They don't want to pay more by going through someone like Gary or um, Colin or, you know, <coughs> excuse me, a, a tour operator that, that um, essentially all they do is package it and offer um, the destination knowledge. They don't want to pay for that. They <coughs> excuse me, the, the, the budget is a such a big thing for, for the client. They're so budget conscious that um, I think one needs to keep looking at 
ways that you can deliver the service, add, add the value, without having to up the price for the customer. How to do that, I'm not sure. I think we uh, pro probably the, the solution lies in the story that Gary told about his, his in-laws. The fact that um, if you do it yourself, you're going to find, um, in, in, in many cases, you're going to find the, 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 the product or the, the, the experience that you get doesn't compare well to if you had given the whole uh, job to an expert. So I'm, I'm, I don't really have a solution. I'm just, I'm, I'm, from my experience, and it's, it's probably a lot more limited than what Otto has, my, um, I, I, I'm not sure that that will work. Thank you. Can you pass it down? Yeah. I'm going to speak to your question or comment, Colin. Sorry, my, my name is Andre. I'm from Discover Africa Group. We're a small OTA or O2O in that sort of realm. Um, and you mentioned or you asked, how do we go about you know, getting to this embracing of technology? And maybe it's a comment or a question for Gary at Go to Africa. Um, would you say that uh, for those who'd like to embrace technology but aren't doing it yet, is it right to get the skills in-house or outsource to these expert uh, tech companies? Because I believe or what I've heard is that you guys have tried a bit of both and you've probably had more success one way or the other. Um, some advice for those who are looking to do this. Um, it's an interesting, uh, it's, it's a, it's a never-ending debate for us. Uh, so, so the skills are in-house for us at the moment. Uh, I can tell you that if, if you're wanting to play in that developer space, um, we are competing with Google and Amazon for, for, for staffing. Um, so uh, the, uh, developers are very expensive resources and um, it also depends on, on, on how far you want to take it. So um, I think there, there are businesses that have scale and have the requirement to have in-house resources and definitely with an in-house resource you can do the kind of development on the fly that you might need to to progress in certain areas quite quickly. But I don't think that small tour operators that wanting a good digital presence need that. Um, I think that can easily be outsourced to go a good development company and a good digital marketing company. Um, because what people are looking for online and what Google is rewarding online um, is genuine engagement with your product. If you've got a good product and you've got a good online presence, um, it, can be, it can be very effective and, and it can be done cost effectively. Um, the, the challenge, I guess, is when you get to sort of our businesses and you start to get to scale and you've got websites, multiple websites and thousands and thousands of pages, then you might start to answer that question. But I think you can create a niche product. I think you can deliver it online effectively, uh, very cost effectively nowadays um, because we're well beyond the whole idea of link farming, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, people want genuine engagement online and Google rewards it. Um, and I think that's relatively easy to do if you've got a good product. Over here, then down here. Hi, I'm Paul Duval from Where To. I think from my side, I think the guys in this room are absolutely critical. We've built our business on you guys and you guys surviving, so you know, keep going. <laughs> Please don't stop, because then we, we will fail. Uh, I think Gary's story summed it up completely. I think uh, I find that there's you, you guys, because we're all a small fragmented business, we haven't, we not, haven't got a big PR machine. So Expedia and Bookings.com can tell you, come here, it's cheaper, and they've, they've kind of got their message across. But uh, the message I tell people is that, yes, you can save maybe 5%, 10%, waste a lot of time doing it, stress on the journey. But actually, if you told somebody, it's, yeah, for 5% extra, you get all the extra things that uh, all the services and knowledge that you guys add to it makes a huge difference. Uh, so I think, and I think... We, I think because it's a fragmented industry, we've also been left behind. And uh, I mean, just from our side, yeah, we're sending pic we're sending long uh, paper itineraries when we know people want pictures and and uh, videos and all that sort of stuff. They respond well to that. So I think it's it's about improving your bu your selling or your buying experience to people. And uh, just in terms of this last comment, in terms of doing it in or out, I think if you've got the money, do it, do as much as you can in yeah in house. Uh, but I think if you haven't got the money, just be careful because it can be, become quite expensive. And I think the good news is that yeah, all the tech companies, I mean, we're racing ahead. We all know technology is kind of the future, but uh, 
all the tech companies or South African tech companies who, who work here are starting to work with each other. So we work with Knightsbridge, E-Res, yeah, we integrate in tour plan, travel logic. So it's all coming together. I think it's going to become a lot easier as a as a company to be able to get kind of a product that they all yeah everyone's talking to each other. I mean, Avis is talking to to Avis probably by AP, yeah, APIs. It's all kind of coming together. It's is going to get easier. It's going to be bumpy, and we try and look into the future and try and understand what's coming. And yeah, we, uh, unfortunately, it's not a crystal ball. We know it's going to change. How it's going to uh, all going to pan out in 10 years' time, we're not quite sure, but I'm confident that you guys will still be around. You add a lot of value to the industry, and we just need to find ways to make, yeah, I think, set ourselves better, and, uh, and uh, yeah, just stay, keep staying relevant, because you add a yeah, huge value. You know. Thank you, Paul. Morning. Um, I don't know, oh, well, you hunt from Dirty Boots, but uh, my main business is African travel. We bought African Travel in the years when Colin was talking about when it, it just came online. Uh, we had the vision that that was the way it was going, but we had no clue how to look after that channel. So early years, we were looking at 100 good inquiries a day, and we used to pick and choose the ones we used to deal with. And then, of course, the, the guys started chopping it away at our pie, and we had to reinvent ourselves. And we went back to the traditional thing. We, we sell consultants. Uh, so we don't sell product. We don't sell mala mala. We don't sell anything specific like that. We sell the ladies in our office. Uh, so a lot like... <laughs> <laughs> at a really good rate. Uh, does, the, does the tax man know about that? <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> okay, I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> All I want to say, the, the way we got around that was uh, bringing back emphasis onto, uh, on, onto the, our product. We are travel consultants. You know, we do not sell... Uh, travel or we don't try and compete with the car rental or the, we use all those channels like you said you've, you started using them in your office uh, that the dynamic pricing is there but it's not a disadvantage for us anymore now we uh, embrace it and we, we use it as part of our, our daily process um, yeah that's it uh, sell, sell your consultants <laughs> if you're not making money fellas, hang on we're going right to the back and Hi, I'm Philippa from Exclusively Hotels, or also known as the Total Stay Group. Um, the, one of the things that I want to point out, or what I've noticed in the discussions, is there's very much an us versus them. The traditional tour operator versus the online tour operator. And I don't think it should be viewed as such. I think that just as the traditional tour operators buy from each other, they can also buy from the online tour operators. I mean, for example, we have an OTA, which we use as a white label for those that want to play in that space. But we also have an, a wholesale platform. And um, we actually buy from our competitors, hotel beds, GTA, and all of that. And at the same time, they're buying from us. So why can we not be doing that in the traditional space as well? That you guys use us. I mean, we can give you access to the bar. We can give you access to the static rates. We can give you access to the availability. We can give you access to all of that if you embrace it. We can give you that, and we can do it through XML. We can do it through more traditional platforms. It's entirely up to you. Thank you. Over there, and I'm coming down here next. Okay, it's uh, Neil from Aha. I've just got a couple of comments, and some of them go back to my in my days in that I spent in revenue management. And in the must have been about the mid '90s, we removed travel agents' commissions from all travel agents. Um, uh, from the market, in the South African market, okay? So the travel agent, well, we're obviously usually popular with the, I'm talking about the corporate travel agent now. So we're obviously a hell of a popular with them, and we took away the, the famous 10% commission. Okay, and it was, uh, I probably can say it now, not then, but it was, it was probably engineered between the bigger groups. Um, in, the, in those days, I was with, with Soho Sun. So we removed travel agents' commissions, and there was a, a, a wild bun fight while they tried to re-engineer their businesses, although we had given them warning for probably about a year. Warning that it was coming, it was coming, it's coming. What we then found was, and I was just listening to this um, 
service fee that was spoken about. Then the, the agents then tried to scramble and charge service fees onto the client. So they tried to get their, recover their commission through that route. What we've, what we've seen over the last 10 or so years is that that model has turned full circle. Okay? So then we had uh, certain agents double dipping, so they would then, they would then charge the service fee onto the, onto the client and then come to the, come to the hotel and try to hold the hotel ransom uh, to recover a percentage or, uh, or some of that commission back. So then we had a double dipping phase. And then it was up to the hotel to decide, or the hotels to decide whether they wanted that business on that basis or not. What we've seen now, though, is that, the, that that's, no lo that's no longer a, a great working model, and we're almost back to the commissions. And those commissions, regretfully, in some cases, are more than 10% where we started 10 or so years ago. So that's my comment on the, the, the service fee. And maybe there's a learning for the two operators to sit with the retail agents and see if there's anything in that in that space that can, that can, work, that can work a little better. Have, having said that though, and listening over the last couple of days, the, per, perhaps there's an the answer that lies, that lies in people working together. Because Paul just said that we need the two operator, I think you guys in the front, Colin, you mentioned the two operator. But remember, as in the hotel space, we need the beds from the two operator, otherwise, we, you know, that's also access, gets us access to a market. So we, we don't want to, well certainly our approach is not to try and favor one over another or one channel or an OTA over a, over a two operator, let's say. So it's not an opportunity for product and let's say two operator to work together to go to that market. So instead of perhaps fighting over the rates and the 18 months in advance and the things that we heard yesterday in the last session, isn't there a space that says, well, why don't we work with product, go to market? Is, is there a way, is there a way and, 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 and to, to do that, that we, we sort of guaranteeing the supply chain uh, through, the, through that way? You know, things like technology are going to come. Uh, they're already here, they're going to come. So it's working together to get to, get to, the, to get to the source market. Thank you, Neil. Very insightful. I really like it. Anybody want to comment on Neil's points there? All right, we had hand over here. Uh, my name is Vanessa Nucci, and I represent exclusively hotels, which falls under Total Stay. So Philippa is our, um, she's our senior, and she's new business development, but we do sales. So what I want to, I just want to clarify a few things. Guys, we are really your friends, okay? Wow. Yeah. Can we have more hotels say that? Okay, <laughs> we are. We can't do without hotel inventory, and we can't do without you. We are a B2B platform. We are a bed bank. So without travel agents and without tour operators, we, we cannot survive. We are not a B2C platform. That is a booking.com. Okay? So, <clears throat> very important here. We, um, we, s we will uh, offer an inventory of over 100,000 hotels. We also function in 18 different languages. So for you as tour operators, you can't speak to somebody in Mandarin, potentially, if there's a problem with a hotel. But we can. We offer 24-7 uh, customer care. Um, you have account management from us in South Africa to assist you. And I think what's really important here is that we offer live availability, live inventory. So at the last minute, on the same day, you can make a booking through us, and we will secure that booking for you, even a year out in advance, a year whenever. You can make a booking for today, and you can make it for a year in advance. So I think what we're talking about is the fear of the unknown. All you have to do is ask the questions. Sit, ask, we'll sit for a day. But you actually have to realize that we're not the enemy, we're actually there to assist you. And it definitely is the future. Uh, uh. Uh, hi, Craig, um, New Frontiers Tours. Um, in, the, in the quest to remain relevant as, as a tour operator, and I think a large number of us here that are tour operators are actually tour brokers rather than tour operators, and that we don't own um, any or, or, or some of the product that we, that we sell. And I think one of the ways that certainly we are looking at being more relevant is how do we have more control over the supply chain so that we actually have something to sell that makes us unique or that gives us access to 
um, space or availability or experiences that people can't get um, elsewhere. Colin, you, you, you mentioned that you're able to, to book space through an OTA. Um, why, as tour operators, aren't we, don't we have the same access to that supply chain that OTAs do? So there's many ways of doing it. And Colin, there was, a, there was a company called Wilderness Safaris that owned all their lodges and camps. Um, so it kind of did it the reverse way and had the supply and then started a tour operator. Um, or you can have loads of cash like Martin and, and go out and buy hotels <laughs> later on after being a tour operator. Um, or for the rest of us that are essentially brokers, um, how, do, how, do we, how do we have some control of the supply chain? Um, either through allocation, um, which is difficult, um, or uh, do we have our own guides, or do we have our own vehicles, or do we have our own experiences that sets us apart that makes people want to come to us to, to book something and then expand their experience with us by booking the rest of the arrangements. Or if we're not sizable enough to do something like that, um, do we have a relationship with our suppliers that we can call on them? So when we want an H1 between 25th of December and the 1st of January, we can pick up the phone and phone Lance and Lance says, no problem, Craig, I will give it to you even though it's showing that it's completely unavailable online uh, or anywhere else. And I think that's one thing as, as tour operators we've, all got, we've got to think of is what can we actually do to control um, our supply stock to, to give us the upper edge. Thank you, Craig. I think we're running out of time. One more question over here, then we'll wrap up. Hi, Ernest Temby, Elephant Park. Perhaps the subject that hasn't been raised yet is the online unauthorized use of intellectual property, trademarks, brands, I think the obvious one is that everyone tries to optimize their sites around Kruger. Um, they're not sand parks, but there is a, a host of, of unauthorized use of copyright of, of um, product owners' websites, the unauthorized use of their brands, the registration of domain names that are similar or identical to, to the registered trademarks of property owners. Um, I, th I think it's something that at some stage needs to come into the debate. Thank you. Okay, Gary wants to respond. Yeah, it's an interesting topic because um, uh, it's something that we've dealt with over the years, obviously, but um, I think one of the things to be, be very acutely aware of is that particularly Google is very acutely aware of that as well. And uh, Google is increasingly better and better at recognizing domain authority so if, you're, if you own a domain or you operate a domain um, that's not yours, uh, Google is getting very, very good at recognizing the true domain owner. So if you've got a krugerpark.com domain and you're not actually Kruger Park, Google is getting better and better at ranking Kruger Park above you. So, so if you're just going to play in that Google space, um, it, it, it's getting better and better at, at recognizing the true authority for that domain. And then the other thing is, is, is that exists and, and, and it's one of the things you need to deal with as a property owner. Do you, do you want to own a domain and, and own the distribution channel of a certain thing? Then you, you know, you, it's, it's a competitive environment. Um, but I, I can say from, from a GoToAfrica perspective, we used to own a host of domains like that. We don't own and operate them anymore because they're not commercially viable for us to own and operate other people's domains. We do what's genuine to us under GoToAfrica.com domain and Google recognizes that. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. I think it's time to wrap up. Where's David? David, I think we're, we're at time. But folks, it's a very interesting discussion. I think the issue for me is that I think the tour operator is hugely, hugely important. But we will see casualties if people don't accept change. And I love what the Dirty Boots guys were saying, is that you're actually talking about <laughs> your consultants. We're adding a huge amount of experience to a person's travel. And I think what, if you're going to really survive, we have to embrace change. We have to accept that Airbnb is coming. But we can outcompete Airbnb through personal service, through experiential travel, through speed. We didn't really touch on speed. And I think that's where the technology issue comes in. We have to embrace technology. We have to make sure that we can turn out an itinerary and a costing literally within 12 hours. If you can't get that out in 12 hours, I think your future is going to be bleak. You have to invest every single thing you can do to make sure within 12 hours a complicated itinerary is done out there and it's done 
superbly with lots of extra experiences which people can't normally buy on the internet. We have to go to those little non-commodity uh, sort of add value ads, which we have to really push through. And I think if we do all that, if we come together as an industry, we really focus on delivering an, an extraordinary experience. Remember, we're in the continent of experiences, and I think we undersell South Africa. We have an opportunity to really make sure that everybody who goes out here is our best ambassador. And when Mrs. Schwartz goes out back home and she's had the finest trip through booking through a tour operator, through the channel, and she's had all these extraordinary experiences which she can't get online, I think you've got a huge rosy future. The calorie is that if you don't do it, I think your businesses are going to start going down, down, down. Hopefully, most of you will embrace change. And Lance, thank you very much for coming out and giving us a, a, a rather sobering look at this whole issue. I think we've really got to look at what the product guys are doing. They also need to make cash. There's enough money in there for everybody. The issue is experience. It's the number of people we bring to our continent. And we've all got to do our very best to, as the minister said, We've got to sell South Africa with passion. Even though we've got all the visa stuff and that, we've got to make sure that we really go out and we deliver ex extraordinary experiences. And that's the way we're going to grow this business. Panel, Colin, Martin, Gary, thank you very much, everybody, and Lance for putting his neck on the line. I hope you found it informative and valuable. Thank you very much. Thanks, Colin. That was... Uh it was certainly illuminating. Um, Paul Medema, uh, our resident activist, <laughs> is now going to convene the responsible tourism. <laughs> so, the smart money, how many, how many times do you think Paul's going to say whitey in this session? <laughs>